brand is not BS to me. Most people argue over BS. My brand is not BS to me. A lot of people say, oh, you know, Diane is so aggressive. Diane is so loud. Diane is this, Diane is that. Well, when I'm talking quietly, you're not listening. But it's when I get loud, I assert myself. I'm checking you when you're wrong. I'm speaking up. I'm addressing the situation. Then I'm loud. Or I'm belligerent. Or I don't know how to communicate. Or whatever other BS you want to try to create a narrative and say that it is what it is. But those of y'all that have been following me, there have been multiple opportunities for you to really get to know me and have a conversation with me. I have given free business advice, free business game. I talk about my business, team business. I talk about the training camp side of it, the, comp the major red side of it, the HBCU side of it. I talk about um, the godly side of it. We talk, we do inspirational conversations, motivational conversations. I talked about my life. I share everything. When I say everything, everything. I am an open book. See, a lot of people are new to my page and a lot of people are new to me. So that's why a lot of the way I talk, my rhetoric, me being loud and aggressive, it comes across as something that you perceive it to be when you don't even know who I am. And the thing is, people don't care. People are so willing to put a, a label on you and to judge you because they think they know you. So let me give you a lesson real quick. Number one, I started my dancing doll organization in 2001, August 20th, 2001. I will never forget the day. I started it at Pied Piper Playhouse in my grandmother's cafeteria at the daycare that she ran. And I started the team because back then, a lot of the girls that I saw from high school, everybody was pregnant. They had these pregnancy packs it was cute to be pregnant. It was cute to run around with a baby on your hip and, you know what I mean, running away. It was cute back then, back in the day. In those times, that, that, that time, it was cute. Well, Diana, why did you name the team the Dancing Dolls? Oh, you knew about a Southern University? No, I didn't. Well, how could you not? Because I didn't. Back then, there was no such thing as Instagram or Facebook or YouTube. You know, there was none of that. I never followed any of it. I grew up in a household where my uncle went to Moore, Morehouse. My um, cousins and aunts went to Morris Brown and Clark Atlanta. My mother went to Jackson State. All I knew was those three schools. If it wasn't a part of that family of HBCUs, you didn't exist to me. It wasn't even a thing. It was what I was raised around. It was what I knew. Well, Diana, how did you come up with the name Dancing Dolls? When I grew up, I grew up in the Cabbage Patch Kid area. The Raggedy Ann and Andy era. era. I grew up in that era where the dolls were white. The dolls weren't black. And if you had a black doll, it was very, very rare. So my mom bought me this black doll. She had on purple shorts, on purple top, and roller skates. And she, she had um, music. So when you would turn the little knob in her back, she would skate across the floor and she would dance. She looked like one of those girls from the 80s with the headbands on and the cute little shorts and stuff. She looked like one of those girls but she was brown like me. I had a Barbie doll. I had one black Barbie doll and the rest of them were white. My mom built a dollhouse for me when I was a little girl and it was my bed. My bed was made, the front of it was made like this and the back of it was made like this. It was made out of wood. My mom used to use this transparency paper. They had these big, huge ass projector screens and she would project pictures onto this piece of wood that she painted and she would trace it with pencil. Then she would go back and she would paint it. I will never forget it was white and it had green and pink and yellow flowers. And underneath it was my dollhouse. See, before there was even a dollhouse dance factory, I lived in a dollhouse. Still, how did I get the name Dancing Dolls? Well, I remember trying out for J set five, six, seven times. I can't remember, but so many that I can't even count. I tried out so many times and I never passed body cut. I never understood because I was petite like the other girls. But I, I kind of realized later on that my past was a big issue. Not a big deal. So I said, you know what? I went and talked to Dr. Magruder. And I remember him telling me, you know, Diana, the harsh reality is if you make this team, what about those girls? And I never thought about the I thought about the team. I always thought about myself. So anyway, backtrack. 
the reason that I had to give some context. So the reason why I called my dance, my dancing, the dancing dolls was because I had a black doll that was on roller skates that used to dance. And I just remember her being so pretty and I wanted to dance like her. I grew up taking clogging, folk dancing, square dancing, tap, jazz. I grew up taking your basic. I never knew what major red dance was. I never knew what it was because it wasn't something that we did. We did um, your classical type of dance, your normal, what they call normal styles of dance. When I grew up, I grew up in the 70s. For those of you guys that do not know, I, grew, I was uh, born in 78. I grew up in late 70s, early 80s, okay? So anyway, fast forward. I named my team the Dancing Dolls because I wanted my girls to dance and look pretty like my doll that was on roller skates. I created Dollhouse Dance Factory because going inside of the dollhouse that my mom built for me as a kid, it was my bed, I used to dream underneath there. I came out, came up with so many ideas and I was able to pretend that I was somebody else just for a little while. So you don't know my childhood. I grew up in a house full of foster kids. Myself and my brother were the only real children that my mom had. And the other two, the other four or five, they were foster kids. So we saw kids come and go. I remember Trisha and Jeremy. They came and went. But then there were four that stayed with us. They stuck and they became family. Kyle, Connor, Solomon, and Tony. Those four were my became my adopted brothers. So I was the oldest of all of these kids. My real brother Darnell and my four adopted brothers. I was the, the oldest out of all of those kids. So imagine your mom working for the city of Jackson. She drives a school bus in the morning, a school bus in the evening. And she's working for the city of Jackson to make ends meet for all six of y'all. So that means as the oldest, I had to step up. So yeah, going in and out of that dollhouse, I began to dream and put myself somewhere else and pretend that I was somebody else so that I, I, could, I could remember that I'm a kid and not have to focus so much on taking care of my brothers, okay? So when I created the Dancing Dolls, it was my opportunity to feel free, to feel pretty like the doll on skates. Had nothing to do with Southern. I didn't even know who Southern was. They may have existed since 1969, but I never knew who they were. Again, Jackson State is where my mother went to school. My mother went to school in, to, with, at Jackson State in the 70s. My mother played Delta Sigma Theta at Jackson State in 1976. I was born in 1978. So there's no way I would have known. I was born and around Jackson State during the time where the plaza was the plaza. You could drive up on the plaza, okay? So I'm sorry, I just didn't know who they were. Not saying that they weren't relevant, just didn't know who they were. I moved from Mississippi in 1995, and I moved to um, Los Angeles, California. I started going to school at Cal State Dominguez Hills University. I went to school there. The school was still being built. It's not what it is now. It was still being built. And I started my education in college. I was supposed to go to Jackson State <clears throat> when I graduated high school in 95, but I did not go because I graduated high school when I was 16 years old. And my mom said, you are too young to be on that campus because if it's anything like it was back when I was there in 76, I can imagine what it's going to be like now if you were to go and you're only 16. So my mom decided to move back to California where her mother and cousins and sisters and brothers were. And we moved to California. I got into so much trouble in California, ruined my credit in California, ruined my credit in California, got into so much trouble. And my past in Cal my past started in California. And my past became the testimony for my life. I did a lot of things, sacrificed a lot of things about myself to make sure that my mom and my family had what they needed to have. My mom had no idea that I was doing the things that I did. But my mom also had no idea that I knew that she was being uh, put out of her home. She didn't know that she didn't know that I knew that the lights were getting getting ready to get cut off, that they didn't have food. Like she didn't know. She didn't know. So I took it upon myself to use my 18-year-old credit and put my name on my mom's house. So she had a second person on the house so she wouldn't lose it. My mama never knew. My mom has a brain tumor on the left side of her brain, had a brain tumor on the left side of her brain, and it was causing deterioration, and my mom couldn't remember things, and she was making, she was doing a lot of stuff. And anyway, so anyway, I made the decision to do these things to help my family. 
right? My mom never knew the bills were getting paid. And I'll, I'll tell this story maybe again another another time because I don't feel like getting upset. But my mom's boyfriend at the time took credit for it, not knowing that it was actually me. And my mom had no idea. So anyway, my mom decided to move back to Mississippi in 2001 and I followed suit um, later on and I ended up at Jackson State. While I was there, I tried out for the JCS multiple times, never made the team. And in the midst of it, I said, you know what? I'm just going to start my own dance team. My grandmother was talking about how teen pregnancy was on the rise. Like it was just terrible. So what are you going to do? She said, Diana, there are so many different schools here. Jim Hill High School. I remember Jim Hill. Oh, my God. The girls are so pretty. Callaway High School, Forest Hill High School. All of those teams, all of those schools had dance teams. So she said, why don't you create a dance team? So it was kind of going to be like we were the dance team of that school. That was how it started. It wasn't supposed to be what it is. So they were called Pied Pipers Dancing Dolls. And the original colors of the Dancing Dolls were green and gold. Our original colors were green and gold because that was the school's colors. So... Anyway, our first banner had this, we made it out of fabric with these um, paper mache, yellow and green flowers, and you know, all this other kind of stuff. So anyway, I wish y'all wouldn't argue in the comments. If y'all gonna do that, go on, go on your own page with that BS. Anyway, so that's paper mache flowers. Anyway, I just remember our first parade. It was Jackson State Homecoming Parade. Ricky Smiley was in the parade, and the kids were just like, oh my God, it's Ricky Smiley. I was like, who? Like, child. That's just so how oblivious I was. I was so sheltered as a child shelter but i remember that homecoming it was 2001 we started the team in august but the parade was in october so anyway my girls didn't even have boost child the kids were wearing tennis shoes kids okay so anyway i remember going to jackson say homecoming and i sat in the u i don't remember who they played but i just remember watching the jay sets and the jay sets had these ponytails and i said oh yeah they look so good it was the ponytails it was the black jazz boots and i just remember how in sync they looked and I said, I'm going to adopt this style. And this style is going to be what my team is going to look like. Mind you, still ain't seen Southern Universe. Still ain't paid them no attention. Had heard about them. Had heard about all of the drama. Meaning like nobody likes Southern. I'm like, well, why? Same thing with Alcorn. It was always Southern and Alcorn. I never really heard about any of the other schools. I never paid attention. I really didn't even care if you want the truth. My focus was on Jackson State because Jackson State was down the damn street. You got to remember, I graduated high school when I was 16. I went to school out in Byram. Like, the, I was in the burbs. Like, my mom never ex exposed me to anything. We barely went any damn where. Anyway, and again, no social media back then. Okay, throughout well, the course of the years of the Dancing Dolls, we started at my grandmother's daycare center in 2001. We moved to Cathedral Church in 2003. We practiced inside of the gym. The gym didn't even have no air, barely had any heat. I remember, um, I forget his name. He was a nice guy with his big, thick glasses. He would mop the floor for us to uh, to use. And sometimes the mop would be sour. So we in there dancing on the floor and the floor just be stinking, child. We didn't use the dance room before and it was, where it was carpeted floor. So imagine dancing on the carpeted floor, carpet burn and everything, child. Listen, when I say crazy. But anyway, we may do. The girls started doing the Mega Everest Parade. We did the MLK Parade in Jackson. We didn't travel a lot far because we did not have the money the farthest we ever went was uapb we never went far so we weren't doing football games and any of that so anyway later on the girls ended up getting the opportunity to perform with jackson state band um and they had on blue it was ariel little little brie three of the girls from Lee prince and pearls portia marquita it was a, quite a few of the girls jackson state embraced the girls and jackson state started allowing the girls to march out behind them out of the stadium dance in the stands dance at the basketball games like jackson state embraced the dolls and i just remember the girls running up on dr liddell at the end of at the end of the christmas parade just being so excited to see him and he kept telling me i'm really proud of what you're doing keep going anyway the girls became kind of like an, like an item at jackson state they started performing at jay said tryouts in the old gym when the old gym was the old gym they danced inside at the um in the aac i remember i have vhs videos of jackson state's pet band playing for the dolls as they performed on the basketball court like it was so many things that was done throughout the course of the years to embrace the dolls anyway in 2010 we ended up moving from cathedral church to dollhouse dance factory so how did we get the studio well my husband and i met in 2007 we met in 2007 um we ended up getting um engaged in 2008 and in 2009 um no we ended up getting engaged in 2008 a couple of months after we got engaged i got pregnant 
And in 2009, we got married. So I ended up, my husband wanted to move to Atlanta so bad. And I was just like, God, I got a team. I don't want to move, yada, yada, yada. So anyway, long story fast, we ended up moving to Atlanta. And Janir Kid and Tara, Tara Cousin, ended up taking over the Dancing Dolls at the time. And both of them, they were running the team. They were doing a great job. Something for me just felt broken because this was my organization. I didn't want to get rid of the team. I wanted to be here. Blah, blah, blah. So I remember my husband saying, well, we're going to move back. Well, and I'll tell the story about what happened, happened to us. Us when we first moved to Atlanta to go on broke, the, evic, getting evicted, the car repossession. I'll tell that story another time. So anyway, we moved back to Atlanta in 2010. And I told my husband, so where are we going to stay? What are we going to do? We ain't got nowhere to go. We ain't got nowhere to stay. We ain't got no, <laughs> what are we doing? He said, we're going to open up a business. I was scared to open up a business, but he wasn't. My husband was always the one that was convicted in the spirit and believed in God so much. We could do all things. I am going to be great. Anyway, we moved to back to Jackson. In 2010, found Dollhouse on Ellis Avenue, opened Dollhouse up. When we opened up Dollhouse, baby, we ain't had no blinds. We couldn't pay to get the get the um the electricity turned on in our name, so it stayed in the landlord's name for a whole year. I don't know why he never knew, but it stayed in his name for a whole year. We were paying the bill, but it stayed in his name because hell, we couldn't afford the deposit to switch it over. Oh, uh, hello. So then we had we didn't have no gas for the whole year because the five hundred dollar deposit might as well have been five thousand, baby. We didn't have it. Child. Okay. So anyway, we um we ended up keeping having the dollhouse that first year. We had 23 students the first year, 23 students the second year, but dancing dolls was always in the building. We never made it mandatory for them to take class. So anyway, we started to build our team within that building. And then in 2014, I started getting these crazy calls. 2013, I started getting these calls about wanting to do a TV show about the dolls. I'm like, child, please, whatever. You know, crank calls or whatever. But they stopped calling the dollhouse from these 818 numbers and they start calling, um, I started sending me emails saying, Diana, pick up the phone. So I finally picked up the phone and called back to try to figure out what the hell they wanted. And they giving me details about how they wanted to start this dance, start this TV show about reality, about dance. And it had to be about community dance teams. And they, they found me on YouTube and how interesting it was, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, fast forward. Let's just skip all of the, because it's a lot. My story is really, really long. But fast forward to um, 2014, 2013, they come in, they do the pilot, we shoot the pilot, 2014, the show gets picked up, and then now here, boom, we're on TV. It's a lot of backstory in there, which is the real reason why I fucking hate Neva, but that's in there as well. It's a whole story about why I hate her and what she did to the girls, to me, to child it's a whole story but anyway it's a whole story about how we even got on tv because people say oh diana you weren't the you were that you were, you've always been famous. no because baby the repossession the eviction the food stamps i ain't even get into all that because we ain't got time trying to get to the point because this live is about the dolls ain't about me okay anyway so 2014 the show airs the, the previews of the show aired during the gabby douglas story in 2014 boom we're cast on tv we got all this stuff going on first year i remember the girls just not being ready because they kept saying you know you guys are winning every category we got to find something to challenge y'all so they brought out um the the stand battle stand battle just wasn't a thing that we wanted to do anyway we're still performing doing battle of the bands the team is growing x y and z and here we are now on tv I ain't had no time to look at nobody's football game, see nobody's football, let alone attend a football game, okay? So, again, I still never saw any of these teams. It wasn't until 2015, after the first season of the show, that, no, I'm lying, 2014, after the, after the first season of the show when Cat graduated, Cat went to Alcorn, and I started really paying attention to Alcorn because Cat was there. See, the real truth is I never paid attention to Alcorn because for what? No shade, but for what? My focus was on Jackson State. My focus was on patterning my team after Jackson State. I went to the games to watch Jackson State march and change formations so that I could learn how to march and change formations for my dolls on the field, on the floor, because we were trying to whoop some ass for field show. Anyway, so I just started paying attention to Cat win. And I really started paying attention in 2015 when Kalita went. That's when I really started paying attention. So... After those two years, I remember being at a Jackson State game, and I saw these girls marching to the stadium. They had on this white suit. I want to say it was white. I think it was white. I can't remember. I just remember them marching to the stadium. And I kept saying, they're so pretty. They're so pretty. They're so pretty. It was like, I think it was 2016. And I said... Who are they? And everybody kept saying, oh, that's Southern. You know, we don't like Southern. It's Southern week. It's Southern week. Like, I would hear people say it, but I never, it never dawned on me. 
So I just kept watching them from afar and it was just, they moved dainty. They were giving me the movement like some of the um the, the dolls that I would see on like My Little Pony, um, what do you call them, the Care Bears. Like everything was just always so dainty. So I said, well, let me go over here and see what's tea. Uh, it was 2016. I walked over there and mind you, I am a Jackson State fan to my core. You know what I'm saying? Me, a JSU fan to my core. I walked over there and I remember just staring and I said, damn, them suits is cut up high. You can damn near see their public hairs. And I said, what is happening over here? They wear uniform. I was, I was blown away because I ain't never seen no shit like that. And then it was hot. So they were sweating. I said, baby, is this legal? Because I remember wearing stuff like that back in the day when I used to act a fool in, in, in California. I had never seen a dance team that wore suits cut that high. But I was intrigued. So I stayed over there. After halftime, all the way to the fifth quarter, and I just stared. And I remember taking a picture with the girls. And later, I came to find out that that captain was Danielle Stamper. I didn't find out until later. But that is the year that I started paying attention to Southern. That's the year. I never still, it never really dawned on me that their team was called the Dancing Dolls. Because... They, they were Southern, Southern dance team. And again, my focus was on Jackson State. I need you to understand this, okay? So, people say, well, you lie, you lie. You can say whatever the hell you want to say. I'm telling you what it is. And you can believe me, or you can take this spatula. One of the two. I don't care at this point. Anyway, so, because that's the truth. I ain't got no reason to lie, because I could just tell you what it is. And I'm telling you. I ain't got no reason to lie. Anyway, moving on. So, after then, I started focusing and really paying attention to what was going on. I said, okay, now there's a lot of other schools out here in the swag. We need to, I need to start paying attention. I was more focused on Elite Prince and Pearls, Purple Diamonds, Golden Dazzlers, okay? Finesse Entertainment Showstoppers. Our community dance world, the Golden High Steppers, okay? The Prince and Tigerettes, okay? The infamous Dancerettes, okay? I was focused on the Mighty Marches of Memphis, okay? I was focused on Miss Sunshine Drill Team. I wasn't focused on an HBCU because that wasn't my world. Okay, when I graduated from Jackson State in 2005, I started working with the Twirlers. And that's when I started to see these teams more and more and more. And I'm like, damn, I never paid attention to it. It never dawned on me. You would think, oh, Donna, because you're so popular. I did not know. Okay, so later on, I started focusing more and hearing more about Southern because Cam talked about how that's what she wanted to go to school. She wanted to go to school there. And that's all she wanted to do. And she dreamed of being a Southern dancer dog. Kalita always talked about all corn and Deja always talked about the sting yes. I said, well, who the hell is the sting yes? I, knew, I had never heard this cheering. It wasn't until Deja started talking about sting yes when she made the team that made me not go start looking at them. And I'm going to be honest, even then, I was still like, I don't see it. No shade. Love everybody. But even then, I was like, child, what they do? They don't look like they do what we do. Because as far as I was concerned, if you ain't dance like a Jay said, you were not worthy. If you did not dance like a Jay said, you were not worthy. It's the truth. Jackson State, that's it. That's all I knew. So anyway, I started paying attention once they started telling me about all these other teams. So anyway, as the team continued to grow and went on and on and on, I started watching the girls talk about the teams they wanted to audition for and what they, where they wanted to go. But my, you, you don't understand how filming works until you're actually in it. And you think that we have more time than we do. And you really think that, you know, you really think that I am more focused on you than I really am. As the, as the show continued to film, I don't think everybody really understand like what all we had to do. In 2014, the show started filming, and we, we were only picked up for eight episodes. And the show grew so fast within the first two, the first two um, episodes that played on the, on the network. They didn't have enough. They didn't have enough um, episodes. They didn't have enough episodes. 
So they came back and added two more to the 10. And by that time, they were adding 14 more and adding a second season. They were, they were calling our seasons 1A and 1B. They had these girls filming from September all the way through May of the previous of the next year. So that means we only had Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's off. We had, we had maybe spring breaks every now and then. But by the time we got done with uh, summer, I started the Book or Die training camps. You know, so the training camp started in 2014. We were on the road 2014, 2015 doing the training camps. Doing the training camps. So 2016, I mean, 2014, the filming was the same, September to May. 2015, filming was the same, September to May. We was on, we were gone during the summer making money on our own away from Bring It. 2016, 17, 18, and 19. Okay? 2016, 17, 18, and 19 was the Bring It Live tour. So imagine we're filming from September to May. And in the midst of that, trying to prepare for the Bring It Live tour and go on tour June, July, August to come back to start filming again as soon as we got back. I remember when Diamond made J-Set, Kiara made J-Set, Sierra made J-Set, Ariel made J-Set. I fought hard to be at as many games as I possibly could because I knew that we were filming so much. How the hell was I supposed to do that? And again, still, when focused on Southern University because I was focused on myself. I was focused on me. The, the last year of the tour, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the tour of Bring It, season five, I remember wanting to do something for my HBCUs. I had, and I started to learn more. How did I learn more? Because I, I'm going to tell you the truth again. I ain't even know nothing about Grambling. Do y'all hear me? I ain't even know nothing about Grambling. You know how I learned about Grambling? Miss Diane Maroney. Miss Maroney was a judge for Bring It. That's how I found out about her. I found out that Ms. Maroney was a judge. She was a judge on bringing and she was the coach of the Gramlin State University Orchids. And it made me start to want to learn more about her because Ms. Maroney was always, come on, sugar love. Hey, sugar love. All right now, baby. Okay, now, Diana, we got to get the girls to point, push the press their ankles. She would always give us tips. And I was intrigued by her because now here is somebody from another HBCU that cares. All I knew was Jackson State. I had become partial to all corn. Because of my girls were there, I started to pay attention to um to um Southern because of Danny, and also because Cam was started talking about them. I started paying attention to Alabama State because Deja was talking about wanting to go there. But I'm gonna say it again: all I knew was Jackson State. Okay, so moving on. Once I found out that Miss Maroney was down at Gramlin, I started to focus more on Gramlin, and I became more intrigued. I went to she invited me to um one of the games. And I'll never forget going down. I was like, damn, it's lit down here. It was dun, 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 dun. I said, shit, GS, 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 you, 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 I thought you knew. I said, oh, <laughs> I loved it. And I said, I, I, I want to come back here all the time. Gremlin treated you like family. You walk across the campus, everybody speak. The cheerleaders were screaming and hiding. The band was nice. The band directors were amazed. Like, I was just, I was blown away. I said, yeah, okay. I'm paying attention now. So, I continue to learn more about these schools and continue to invest more of my mental time into them because this is where my girls wanted to go. So I started to support them more and more and started traveling to the different schools. So when Deja made um, the line at Alabama State University, I remember her mom had just had a little, her baby, Deja's little brother, and her mom had gotten sick after she had the baby. Deja's first game, Deja didn't have um, her mom there to support her. I live in Atlanta. So I remember driving to the game. I remember driving to the game and Deja not knowing that I was coming, I surprised her. And that day is when I started paying attention to Alabama State University. This is the truth. You want to know. Here it is. So, Princess was with me. Princess was still a doll. She was a doll in Atlanta at the time. She was with me. And Deja, Deja saw me. Her eyes got so big. And she was just so worried and, like, scared because she was her first game. So, I remember after the game, we hugged the hug the hug. And Princess said, this is where I want to go to school. I said, oh, okay. So, I remember introducing Princess to Dr. Oliver. And Dr. Oliver was so gracious. He's another band director. So gracious. He said, Diana, you are welcome anytime. But see, I had already had a relationship with Miss Anna Marche, who was over the, um, the honeybees. That's my girl. So 
I remember going to see her and they were telling me about the Snapchat series and all things they were doing. And Dr. Oliver said, anytime you want to come to a game, I got you. I never wanted to abuse it. Never wanted to abuse it. Right? So I never asked him. I told Deja, I said, if I could come, I'm going to come. I remember coming to, I think, three games that season. And the more I watched, I said, okay, this girl loves this. She's good at it. I'm going to keep coming to support. And if I could do anything in any way financially to assist, I will. So I was never asked, and I never saw that they needed anything because the costumes were gorgeous. So I moved on. And I just came to support. So I remember, you know, Looking back on all of the years of me having the Dancing Dolls, I be, I knew that, you know, Southern's name was the Dancing Dolls back in when I first met them in 2016. Now, you can believe it or not, I really give a damn because it's the truth. But I remember meeting them, and, and I'm telling you, I was smitten by Danny. She was this perfectly poised, put-together woman, and I was just like, she looks like my Barbie doll. Danny looked like Skipper. Skipper was brown skin. My Skipper had curls in her hair. My Skipper had Skipper had um, short shorts. Yeah. She was cute. And I just remember looking at Danny and saying, she's so pretty. She's so pretty. And that's what made me pay attention to them. So anyway, I'm saying all of that to say that I've built a lot of things with this team. I've done a lot of things. But one of the things that... We, one of the names that we've always have been called is Didi Foel. The dolls have, my dolls, have always been called Didi Foel. I never knew that there was a problem or anybody had a problem with us being called the Dancing Dolls because we coexisted for years. We performed, you know, in the gym, on the basketball court. We were there. You know, we have girls that had and still have girls that, um, love the organization that love the team you know I, I we still have girls that are that are that still want to attend but now it's kind of like why should I if they don't like us you know so anyway my point in all of it a lot of people feel like they know but really and genuinely have no idea like how we started how things were for us as a team um, what was it like you know, being a part of this organization? What is it like growing with an organization? What is it like um, growing through a lot of the growing pains and, you know, having opportunities to do some of the things that we've been able to do, building up this name? And I, my, my biggest issue, you know, with all of it, and everybody can feel however they want to feel because I'm okay with that. I said what I wanted to say the other day. My biggest issue is that if there was a problem, I wish something had been said a long time ago before we got so far into this. So where now we're having to explain to the kids that they can't be who they are because, you know, a university is telling them that they can't use a name that they worked so hard for. And the alumni, my alumni are just mind blown you know, confused and just not really understanding. You know, I was it was said that I'm not a mentor because I raise my voice and I cuss and I yell and I this and I that. You name one person that listens when you move gingerly. When even, even when you have a conversation with your kids regularly, you know sometimes your children, your your real child takes you for granted. But when you start to raise your voice, I'm looking for this video. When you start to raise your voice, now they listening. You feel me? I'm saying all that to say is that had I had a spoken gingerly, had I had a spoken gingerly when I had this conversation the other day, nobody would have listened. I didn't want it to be a woe is me. I wanted to get everybody's attention because you need to be aware that if you don't protect your business, it's really easy for somebody to take it from you. I got a lot of calls from different people that have told me they appreciated me speaking up about, you know, my issue. Not saying, yeah, get them. Nobody called me like that. It was a situation where everybody understood why I was angry and hurt and confused and just, I didn't get it. Because, see, this is, that's Kalita and Taylor. 
Is it something that we stood on? And something that we built for years? But to sit back and just be told through a piece of paper here, you can't be you no more. You just kind of be like, wait, what? That was where the problem came in for me. That was where it came in for me. Building a studio. So, you might not like my tactics. You might not like how I talk. And I know you on here watching. But my shit always works. My kids are tough. Deja told me. I knew that if I could survive dancing dogs. And everything that I went through being here with you. I could survive anything. I remember I've had multiple parents tell me. That if it wasn't for me and my coaching tactics and what I've done for their kids, she don't know where her daughter would be. I'm going to read you a message from one of my parents whose daughter just made an HBCU line just recently. I'm going to read it. And I don't talk to my parents like that a lot because I always want to keep it separate. She said to me, she said, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for caring when you didn't have to. Thank you for giving us a second home and a family outside of all we had. Thanks for giving my girls all they ever needed to know that they are that girl. And thank you for everything. I mean, the list can go on. But I just wanted to remind you that what you have done will never be forgotten. I'm starting to get so much better. And soon I'll be finished with nursing school and I'll be working again. But I want you to know it doesn't matter what I have to sacrifice for my daughter to remain on the team. So I'd like to, I would like to thank you for the scholarship that you gave us from the bottom of my heart. It's something that has fulfilled my happiness. And believe it or not, it was the only thing that kept me living when I was, uh, when I was bad in depression. You checked on me. I made a mistake and you never judged me. I'll forever love you. And one day I'll tell the world, and with, with your permission, how amazing you were during our most difficult time. I love you. I'm not good with words. I have so much more to say, but one day I'll be able to express it uh, express it all. Love you for, uh, forever, Diana and Coach D. We got you. We got you now. Both your true heart and your tough love. So you never understand what it's like. This was before, before her daughter auditioned. She sent me a picture of her daughter going to prom. And she, and she sent me this after her daughter made the team. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You don't understand how your organization has helped me to raise amazing young ladies. I say I'm proud with, proud with you and your staff is an understatement. You all have helped me give my daughter the tools she needs to be to succeed in life. You opened doors that we never knew existed. And because of what you taught us, we now know so much about HBCUs and more. I could write a book about how phenomenal you have been, but you already know that. I can't believe that she's even my daughter at times laughing out loud because you know me yeah i know your sister you look look hood excuse me she said but i was just reaching out to say thank you dd 4 l keep on being amazing because you are changing lives and helping break generational curses see the thing is you don't know who i am and what i do all you know is what i allow you to see because i don't allow everybody into my space i don't allow everybody into my life i don't give everybody that opportunity to even be around me so you only know what I give you the privilege to see. You don't know. See, people that really know me, they know my heart is bigger than this world. I do and have done so much for so many people. Let me give you another example. How my, blood run, how my love runs deep for HBCUs. When Melanie's got the job at Tennessee State University, she, I was one of the first people she told. And what out of my mouth I said to her, I said, congratulations. Now what do you need? See, Melanie's was a, a part of the twirling sensations at Jackson State. She, I was her coach. I was her sponsor. I made sure she was good. So I knew going into this, she was going to have a hard time because she's rebuilding the team over there. So I said, well, Melanie's, I'm going to donate some money to y'all. I'm going to give you $15,000 to do what you need to do with your team to get your team in order. I'm going to give you some money for, for hair, makeup, uniforms, tights, fishnets, boots, whatever, whatever you need. I'm going to give you some money for it. No questions asked. And she just kind of looked at me. Tell them, Jalen, that's my baby right there. Congratulations on your graduation, my love. A lot of them don't know. So, Melanie's never asked me for anything. I asked her, what do you need? Not for clout. I went to Jackson State. I had to go to Tennessee State. I don't have any girls over there. But Melanie's was my girl. That was my friend. 
So I said, what do you need? I had the means, so I donated. A lot of people don't know that the year that Michaela made J set, I donated seven, almost eight thousand dollars to the J to the J sets. Diana, what do, what do you mean? Well, the year before Michaela made the team, there was a lot of conversation and chatter on social media about the girls' makeup. So my makeup artist, Monet Jackson, that lived, she was my makeup artist on tour. She lived in Jackson at the time. I paid her to do the girls' makeup for every football game and every parade for the entire season of Michaela's freshman year. I will never forget Kalita, Kalita calling me from down at Alcorn and telling me, Miss Diana, we don't have any uniforms. I called Miss Cole. I donated uniforms to Alcorn State University, Kalita's junior year and senior year. I donated a uniform to the Alcorn State University Golden Girls last year because Kibia asked me. I thought they were good, but I had already committed to donating money to Tennessee State. Had I known in advance that Kibia needed me, I would have went over there. I got girls over there. Makaya, Tanisha, Tania, Star, Sky. I have girls there, Christiana. So, of course, I'm going to help if they ask me. Okay, put you forward. This year. I have $30,000 to personally donate from Diana M. Williams, Inc. as a donation to two HBCUs. Two. One of which I've already been in contact with. And we're already in the works. But the thing is, I've always been a person that gives not because I want anything in return, but I give freely because that's just who I am. That's just me. So when I got the cease and desist letter, it kind of threw me. I felt betrayed by my HBCU community because I've done so much. I've given so much freely without asking for anything. I never asked for anything. Cheered from the sidelines, you know, did what I needed to do to make sure that everybody was good if they asked me, if I came into contact with them. I always celebrated, saluted. My husband always hated me listening to Southern's band, but the damn, the damn jukebox sound good. What you want? It sounds amazing. Most of the time, the, the, the music that we use when we performed, if it was band music, it was them. Do I love JSU? Got them right to my core. But some songs sound great on some teams. Lifetime went after the trademark for the Dancing Dolls, Dancing Dolls, Dancing Dolls for Life. Dollhouse Dance Factory and DD4L when Bring It first started. They were unable to get the trademark initially for Dancing Dolls because there's a fitness company out there called the Dancing Dolls. And they did it on their own. And I never really understood trademarking back then. It was over, really over my head. And I was just like, whatever, I just want to dance. I, you got, I'm trying to focus on the cheering. You got me filming all day. I got interviews. I'm trying, I got a child. I'm trying to get to the football games with the kids. I have too much going on. So much going on. So much going on. So much going on. I don't have time for all that. I just remember them coming to me and telling me that. But I remembered there was a couple of teams in Mississippi with the same name. And I was like, no, nah. I said, I'm good. I was like, I don't want to trademark the name because if you do that, that means y'all gonna send a cease and desist to everybody else telling they can't use it. I don't want to do all that. If you want the truth, it is. I don't want to do all that. I would rather, as long as they don't have no issue with us, we ain't got no issue with them, what's the big deal? I understand business is business, but this was in 2014. I wasn't stressed or tripping off over, over. I wanted us to be able to, I'm not, let me not even say that, I wanted us to be able to. It was more of a, it didn't matter kind of thing to me. Because I'm like, we dance teams. What difference does it make? So anyway, I just remember focusing only on Diddy 4 l There is a dance studio in Wisconsin called Dollhouse Dance Factory. She and I coexist. She's a Milwaukee Bucks dancer. So we coexist with no issues. So anyway, there's a big history behind the team name, you know, how we started, where we are, you know, how we got here. Like, there's a lot of history there. It's a lot. And the truth is the truth. You know, whether you want to accept it or not. No, it is what it is. You know? It is what it is. It is what it is. So, you know, my focus is on oh, moving on. What's next for my kids? So, saying all that to say, the truth is the truth. 
And there's so much more behind, you know, how we were founded and our story and who we are. There's so much more behind it. But malicious, mm -mm. angry, mm -mm. confused, disappointed, mm -hmm. you know, confused and disappointed, yeah. You know, I have a love for these kids that goes a little deep. It may seem strange to you that a dance coach would go that far to protect her team. Now, let me tell you something else about me you don't know. I grew up in middle school, high school, middle school, middle school, high school, and my freshman and sophomore year at Jackson State, I was bullied real bad. I was bullied to the point to where I wanted to quit school. I was bullied to the point to where I went into a personal depression. I didn't want to dance. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to be as well. It was bad. It was bad. Not only was it happening to me, but it was happening to my brother. I just remember coming home from school one day and just not wanting to exist no more. My mom wasn't defending me. I love her, but my mom wasn't defending me. My mom wasn't doing anything. I just remember when I started the Dancing Dolls, how I would go into like this protective mode. Like if anybody said anything to them, did anything to them, looked at them any kind of way, it was more like, yeah, I'm on your ass. And the reason why was because my mom never did that for me. Growing up, I never really had, like, that close-knit family. Remember, I told you, if you go back and watch the beginning of this live, I was the oldest. I had four foster brothers and then my real brother. I was the oldest. So it was me always going inside of my dollhouse. There was a bed, hiding from the world, just trying to get it together. That was my life. So when all of this happened, it triggered the hell out of me. And it had me going back and thinking about that little girl that wasn't protected, that little girl that was bullied, that little girl that didn't want to live, that little girl that ran away back then, that little girl that was handled like she wasn't shit, that little girl. It took me back to that. And I just will never forget how I felt. And I said, I never want to feel like that ever again. I never want my girls to ever feel what I felt. If I could prevent them from feeling any of what I felt, then I'm doing a good job. Anytime the Dancing Dolls had an opportunity to do something, I always wanted to go above and beyond with hair and makeup and costumes and uniforms and just all of the above. I always wanted to make sure that they had more, which is why any opportunity that showed up, I went for it. Being embraced by multiple HBCUs, it reminded me that there are real people out there that really, 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 really love these kids. And that as much as I worry about them being okay, they worry about me. Kayla said the other day, and we were in Jackson, not Jackson, we were in DMV. She said, I've never seen Miss Diana this happy. She said, I never saw her this happy. And I say, you know, I'm happy because I feel like I finally am doing something that's worthwhile. I'm finally doing something that makes sense. I'm finally doing something that I feel fulfilled in. And then all of this shit hit the fan. And I just said, wow. I just never knew that it was a problem. And I think that's probably where the shock, the enrage, the confusion. And then now, me having just said explain. To my kids. But when we would go on tour, it was always Diddy for well, Diddy for well, Diddy for well, Diddy for well, Diddy for well. Diddy for well, Diddy for well. You know, it was Diddy for well. Our fans, the Dance of Dial fans, with a Diddy for well. Like, we took this thing, Stars My Co Captain Sky is. We took this thing on the road. We did all of this work. We did all this work. And now all of a sudden, that's the part that just blows me. That's the part that just makes it so bad. Is that we just had time. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, all this did for me was to push me to be better. 
Building a legacy. Life will go on because everybody knows us as Diddy Foel, and that's cool. You see it's on my chain anyway. I spent five bands on this, so, I mean, it is what it is. But I think that, you know, having to switch gears, especially when we have, we have so many public appearances for ESPN, Slingshot, Denny's, and some other stuff that I can't say just yet. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. It's crazy. But at the end of the day, life goes on. But some people have so many questions. You've got so many questions. So I wanted to share that, like who we are as an organization, this brand that I built from nothing to like where it is right now and like how far we've come to how amazing our fans are.